Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rear view mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this, and it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school, and accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. This episode of the Profit Answer Man podcast is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet, which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice, ideas, and information for small and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. If you've discovered us via the network, then I hope you enjoy today's show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss our episodes. Imagine creating a business where you can charge more than your competitors, pick your clients, spend nothing on advertising, and have a full funnel of jobs. Well, it's real. And our guest today is going to share how he did that with his painting company. Terry Begg is living proof that every single one of us has the ability to overcome our challenges and create the most extraordinary life we imagine. Terry started his painting business fresh out of high school with no money, no experience, no connections, no skills. Armed with nothing more than a pickup truck and a dream, he spent years refining his painting skills, only to discover no matter how good he became, he was just another painter in an overcrowded market. Refusing to settle, he stopped working on his painting skills and began perfecting his people skills, learning what motivates people to buy and taking away the reasons why they wouldn't buy. And his business blew up. He more than doubled his income in six months and over the next year, doubled it again. Since then, Terry has fine-tuned his process for business and personal growth into an easy-to-follow, four-step system. His proven system has allowed his company to grow year after year, even though he hasn't advertised since 2012. Today, Terry's an international speaker and author of Attract and Keep Customers for Life, Four Abilities to Build Trust, Communicate Your Value, and Charge What You're Worth. I'm excited to talk to Terry. I hope you are too. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Terry Beck. It's great to have you join us today. Oh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on the show, Rocky. I'm feeling good and and ready to go. As am I. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Absolutely. I own a, a residential painting company, 
And I started it actually 44 years ago. Still love what I do. And uh, the only thing is when I, every, anything I would have loved more than what, than when I was 18 years old starting that business because I was an absolute, how do I describe it as I was um, a, a train wreck, you might say. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no skills. I had no money to back it. I just, I knew I couldn't work for anyone. I had that entrepreneurial spirit, you know, and, and I had a couple jobs at that time, but I didn't, I never got fired. I just didn't stick around very long. I wanted to learn on my own, do things on my own. And I, I looking back, I took that too far, but because of that, it took me a long time to turn things around in my business. It seemed like I was always just one lost job from going bankrupt. And it was like that through most of my twenties. And, and I got married at a young age at 21. My wife was just 19, made her all these promises. And I didn't come through on any of them for those first few years. But, um, but I can tell you exactly when the, ch the, the changing point in my life was, I mean, they, I mean, some people can narrow it down to a year or a season or even a month or a week. I can tell you the exact moment my life changed. And it was when I came home from work one day after like a 12 hour shift and hot and tired and, and uh, found my wife. Um, I could tell she'd been crying sitting on the couch. Not, not a good thing if you're, if you're uh, the man of the house, right? Sitting there crying, looking up at me. And she only said three words to me that changed my life forever. And they weren't, I love you. They were, Terry, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and and I, I can't explain it other than it was like a, a switch had flipped in my brain. All of a sudden this crappy lifestyle that I had been providing for the two of us was no longer going to cut it now that I knew we had a, we we're going to have a son. And um, there's things I did and that's what I'm hoping I can talk to you about today. But once I started changing things, um, it, it reversed very, very quickly. By the time my son was born, we had uh, moved, went from a one bedroom apartment to a, a three bedroom brand new home we moved into in a very short time. And it was all because of the things I did to turn my painting business around. So what did you do to turn the business around? <laughs> the, the biggest thing is really, there was a lot of things, but what they all amounted to is I started taking action. Until then, I was just letting life, I was just responding to what was happening in my life. I wasn't, I was like going with the flow. I wasn't trying to create the life that I wanted. And once I knew that, I knew where I wanted to go. My wife and I sat down and we we wrote out what we wanted our lives to look like and the number that it, then we put a price beside what it was going to take to do these things and live these lives and live in the house and go to the places we wanted to go. We want to go to Disney World a lot so that we knew it was the happiest place on earth and we hadn't been that happy before that. And um, when I saw the number, it was four or five times what I was making at the time. But with, and within eight months, like I said, by the time my son was born, I had doubled my income. Over the course of the next year, I doubled it again, but, but I didn't answer your question. I started taking action. A couple of the things I did is I joined a professional organization right away, kind of by accident, because I knew I had to market my business. I, I was just going word of mouth. And, and uh, unless you're established, I'm, I'm, I have that now. But at that time, I, I only got the jobs that nobody else wanted, or I was, I was fighting it out in the low price wars with, with uh, painters who were like me, just you know, our customers were the people that were hiring the cheapest and anyone out there who's been in business or in the trades and they know if you take those jobs, you're in for a lot of trouble. They're going to give you, you know, they're the hardest jobs to do, um, the hardest customers to work for. And that was all I had, but I stuck it out. I wasn't going to give up. I started taking action, but I, I knew I had to market myself in a different way. And the first thing I thought to do was I'm going to get into a home and garden show. Nobody, they were at the malls when malls were actually popular. This is back before the internet too. And uh, so I, um, I got in this mall show and um, I found out to be in it, I had to be, a, I, it was going to cost me almost a thousand dollars that I didn't have. But they said, if you're a NARI member, you could get in for like 200 bucks. And I'm thinking, okay, what's NARI? And that's how green I was. It's the National Association of the Remodeling Industry. And you, I could join it for a couple hundred dollars. And then to get into the show was less than, was another couple hundred. So it was a no brainer for me. But what I found was joining a professional organization instantly put me with those guys in there. They were professionals in, in remodeling and in roofing and in insulation, all these other things. And I was still looked at as just a rookie. But once I joined that group in my customer's eyes, maybe not in their eyes so much, but to a certain extent, but in my customer's eyes, I had arrived. I was one of them. It made a huge difference. Being at that um, home and garden show, I must have got 80 or 90 leads. 
The next thing I did is I started calling local newspapers around uh, where I lived and, and the papers that I got. And I asked them, I told them I got this great business, it's unique. And it was really what I wanted, not what I had. And they said, that that's interesting, we, we wanna cover it. So it was before people paid for stories in the newspaper. It was a free, it was the editor came out or the, the writer, I'm sorry, to the job site where I was working. He talked to me, took pictures, put it on um, the business page of the newspaper. And between those few things, the next thing I knew, I had 30 or 40 houses booked to do. The next thing I did is I hired some people and this was scary for me because I didn't have the money to pay them. But I had a system for spraying, spray painting, aluminum siding, cedar sided houses, and we would mask them off, kind of like a car at a body shop where they would sand, we would pressure wash. But then after that, you'd mask, you know, the everything that wasn't getting sprayed, the foundation, the windows covered the roof. And we got so good at it, we were getting in and out in a day. And on a rain free week, we were painting five houses. My cash flow was insane because people would pay me instantly uh, because they were so happy with the results. I um, I moved out of, I, I'm from um, the Akron, Canton area of Ohio, and um, I was started in Akron. There was a lot of competition there, and so I came to Canton, moved out this way, right in between, and um, and, and I was I sort of was a, a, a trendsetter here. It hadn't caught on here yet, and a lot of people were, were seeing they weren't having to replace their siding. They could just have it painted, their aluminum siding, and we, be, and we became the area's industry professionals for that type of work. And since then, I've painted over 5,000 homes. Still do that, still love what I do. We've refined our process to where we can get a house done with fewer people. And uh, I'm still out there doing it. I'm on the crew with my guys. Mostly, I don't have to, but I still love doing it. It's enjoyable. Um, people said, you're having so much success with this. And I was, I, we moved into a much bigger house on four acres. And uh, they said, you need to write a book about what the, what you're doing here. And I, and I didn't want to do it for the longest time because I didn't want the competition to know what I was doing. But, I, but I've realized since that um, that's no way to look at life. I, so now I, I'm the other way. I try to help out, uh, help out other painters, some in my area, any way I can. I, I send them the jobs I don't want. And uh, life is good. But, uh, but it was all because I found different ways to market myself and I wouldn't quit trying. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up on it. That was big. Well, congratulations. You've had Thank you. <laughs> wonderful success. And I like the fact that you're constantly improving your systems and trying to find ways to get the work done faster. I, the people that I see that are the smartest are the ones that are constantly improving their processes. Because at yep. the end of the day, you're going to get paid X to do this job. Mm -hmm. If you can get it done faster, exactly, you can truly win in that type of a game. Yep. And, and I position myself in my area here to where I'm the one that pretty much sets the standard for pricing. I'll, I'll give a bid and a lot of the owners say, um, you, you know, you're the highest one. I usually am. And, and but I know the customer's not looking for the lowest bid. They're just looking for a fair price. But I, I tell them, sure, I may be the highest or close, but I provide more value. And I start talking to them about the things that I do. I don't just say we're going to prep your home. I talk about all the things that we do that make that make up the prep process. But but to, to uh, speak on your point you just made, they're always improving the system. You would think after, I, I've been doing it for um, by about 35 years, because like I said, those first eight or nine years, I didn't know what I was doing, honestly. I was taking any job I could get. But even 30 years into it, I figured out a way to paint houses without having to cover the roofs. We used to come in and pressure wash one day and get these big heavy drops up on top of the roof because you had to cover the roof. Overspray will go up onto the shingles and it doesn't come off. So it's a very bad situation. But we figured out a way to just put metal sh um, shields, four foot metal spray shields into the gutter. Uh, against the drip edge so we didn't have to cover the roof anymore. That one thing started saving us about two hours per house. And if you're doing three or four houses a week, that's a huge savings. So even 30 years into the projects um, that we're doing, we're still finding new ways to save time and still create a, um, a perfect, what I think is the um, exactly what the owners want. And I know I'm right because I, I get testimonials and that's what they tell me. And so a couple key points here. Number one, not being afraid to be the most expensive mm -hmm. because then exactly. you'll get the best customers, <laughs> Yep, not and, the ones that you talked about that hassle you. And some people actually want to pay the highest. I know that sounds insane, but they do. They feel like they're going to get more service, uh, uh, more value. And they don't always on everything. I know there's things that we bought where we paid the highest price and I regretted it. 
but my customers usually don't because we we like I said, we sort of pioneered the, what we do in our area of Canton, Ohio, and they know they're going to get the best. They've seen us for years, our job signs. And we get into a neighborhood, all the houses are aging the same way. And they look at the house we just did and they look at their house and they, they want to bid. And, and it's awesome because I haven't advertised my business since 2012 and I still grow even though I don't want to do more houses because at, at age 63, I, I we do enough. I don't want to split up and, and create another crew, but I do take the best, easiest, nicest houses. What, what I discovered is where I'm at in Northeast Ohio, if you minus out for rainy days and Sundays and sometimes Saturdays, there's maybe a hundred nice days in the year. And we try to paint a hundred houses a summer. And each year I find better houses, nicer ones, easier to do, more money, and so in that way, we, we've grown uh, financially. We had our biggest year yet, even with the COVID here in 2021 was by far we are, our, our biggest year by about $50,000. And I think it's because I, we only do the nicest, easiest, best paying jobs. <laughs> <laughs> it's smart to be able to do that and say, hey, this is what I do and this is how I work. And when you can get to that point, it's it's impressive. So what is it that you're telling the clients that you're doing differently as far as the prep work and so forth. Give us an example of that. Um, everybody, most painters have the same prep, but where I think that a lot of them miss the mark is they don't explain it. They'll just write a bid out. Um, I tell a story in my book where I was giving a bid for a lady and I wrote out, uh, we're going to pressure wash your house. And after that, we're going to come back and we're going to scrape the scrape all the loose paint on the trim. Then we're going to prime it with oil-based primer. We're going to conquer around the windows. We're going to um, cover all the plants and bushes. We're going to mask off the, the cement and cover that. And But the other guy she gave me, and she looked at my bid and she said, wow, this is really a detailed bid. And uh, I said, yeah, I want you to know exactly what we do. She goes, you're a little higher than my other bid, but he, I don't know if he's going to do these things. I said, what do you mean? And she goes, let me go get it. She runs in the house, brings the bid out to me. And I'm looking at it. And all it said was uh, pressure wash, uh, um, prep the siding, paint it and clean up. And that was like it, those four things. And the sad thing about it, Rocky, is I know this painter and he does excellent work as good as we do or, or possibly even better, but he chooses not to explain to the customer exactly what they're going to do. And when you give them more information, they have more trust for you. Uh, sometimes they look at that as, um, you know, if you don't, if you can't explain your process clear and easily and simply so they understand it, then maybe you don't know it well enough anyways. And that's the sad thing. I know this guy and he's a good painter and he pretty much does the things that we do. He just, uh, one big thing is we write out in detail. I make big promises in writing and verbally. And there's other things too. I'll, I'll just stop at that one for now, but there are some more. If you want me to talk about a couple of other ones. We can, but mm -hmm. before we do, it seems that's a standard template though, right? You built that template once with everything that you do. So it's not like you're recreating yeah. the wheel each time. Exactly. I started using a computer and it's just copy and paste now. It's so easy to do. Um, but another thing I, I hate to just, um, while I'm mentioning that copy and paste, I hate to just email a bid. I think it should be personal sometimes. I mean, if you're going to charge someone $5,000 to paint their home, I can't just send a bid over to them and see what they say. I like to go out and I meet with them and I go through it line by line, unless they say, um, no, I know what you do. I saw your system, just send it over. And some do now. And uh, probably one job a week that we do is a past customer. So they know, I already know our system. Um, but, but I found just taking the time to be with the customer, to put them at ease. That's what my book's all about is, is putting your customer at ease because um, they're not looking for the cheapest. And, a lot of times they may not tell you this, they're not looking for the best. They want to make the easy, comfortable choice and they want to hire someone that they trust. So how do you build trust? One of the things I do that I was going to mention, but I thought I'd wait for you to ask the question. Um, the way I build trust in my book, I should say it's broken up into four parts, what I call the four abilities. And they are likability, believability, trustability, and wow ability. And the goal is get the trust. That's the important one. But it, it's hard to become trusted if you're just meeting a, a customer for the first time, even though they've seen you around. So I start out with like, there's little little things I do to make myself likable. Things like be on time, call when I'm on my way, stop and listen to them first. What is their issue? What is their problem? Before I tell them about what I'm going to do for them, little things to make myself likable. 
then, and I still think it's too big of a jump to go from like to trust. So that's where I put in the believability step. And little things uh, for, for that is, is doing what you say you're going to do. Be there at the time you said you're going to be or early. Um, have a website that they can go to and look at. It doesn't matter if you have a great website or not, but if you don't have one, first thing the customer is going to do is they're going to, it's going to throw up a flag. You may be the greatest contractor in the world, but if they can't find you online, there's a good chance they're going to go on to the next one and, and look at them. So I love my website. Another thing, something that builds trust that's on my website, Rocky, is testimonials. They're so important. I made an entire chapter in my book about getting testimonials from your customers because what someone else says about your business, someone who has nothing to gain by saying it is a thousand times more believable than anything you could say. And then, now, and if they people go to my website, they scroll down the list. I tell them click on the the page uh, for testimonials. Maybe you know some of the people, and nobody's going to read them all. There's eighty or a hundred of them there, but it, it really sends a strong message that hey, this guy must know what he's doing. He's made a lot of people happy. So another thing that I do, um, so those get the trust. One of the things I do then to really kind of seal the deal on the trust is what I call risk reversal. And it's a simple concept that a lot of people actually do. They just don't talk about it. And what I mean by that is I tell the customer when I'm done going through everything, they, they'll say something like, okay, where do I sign? How much do you want up front? And I say, you don't have to sign your, the con- I don't even use a contract. I call it a proposal. Contracts to me sound, I don't know, binding, <laughs> I guess like they are, right? But uh, I, I tell them, you don't need to sign it. I don't want any money down and I won't turn a bill in until you tell me you're happy. Now, that that was scary at first doing that. I was pretty confident that we had a great product, but until I started doing it, I didn't realize the power of it. People actually pay me faster when I say that because they're uncomfortable. We did all this work and they want to know when they can pay me and they write the check. And as soon as we're done, it's amazing because I do everything on on my list, everything I wrote out, everything that I promised them, and I'm right there. So those those are big things that build trust, risk reversal, testimonials over promising and still over delivering. That's what gets the great testimonials. We, we usually do more than we promise a little bit more. Um, Have sorry. you ever gotten burned with that? One time. It's funny you said that because that's the expression I, I say. I say I got burned one time. It was about 15 years ago and I should have known better. I, this guy never had any intention of paying me. I honestly believe by the time it was done, and it did cost me. I didn't even go to court over it. I just wrote it off, you know, because going. To, I found if you go to court and you need a lawyer, I know you can go to small claims, but if you need a lawyer, you're going to end up, he's going to get all the money anyways. And I just learned from the experience and um, it's never happened again. I painted over 5,000 homes. And I think if I'd have, I learned from him, I see it now. I would see, I would recognize it. I don't always take every job. Uh, some people, they'll just give off a vibe for all, for all, I mean, I've done 5,000 homes. That means I've probably given six or seven or 8,000 bids. So I've really got to learn about who I can trust and who I can't just like they can from me. And so I know you say that interpersonal skills are what's going to speed success faster than technical skills. Yes. Is that what you're referring to with that? Is the, the, it, that type it, of skill? It is. I say it over and over in my book. The way I put it is, as it work on your people skills first, it'll speed your success faster than your technical skills. What I found is to the average customer, I'm not talking, a, a professional painter could probably look at a wall in a house or siding and, and see if it's a good job or not so good job, even though it, you could get away with not priming and things like that. But the homeowner, the average customer, because I'm in residential repaint, so I deal with homeowners, they could they could look at a wall I painted and a wall someone who had just started and pr- probably look at them both and say yeah they're they're passable they're okay, so it, it's hard to stand out in terms of technical skills of how good of a job you can do, but if you look at those people skills you know they know if someone if they like someone they know if they believe someone they know if they trust someone so becoming trusted uh, again what I said is, what I'm saying is people aren't necessarily looking for the best painter in the world. Or, or whatever service that you offer or, or job that you do, or even the cheapest, but they are looking for someone they can trust, someone who will give value and someone who will put their mind at ease. And that's how I position myself. I'm that guy that all, I tell them, the only thing you got to think about once you tell me to do the job is pick a color. After that, everything else is handled. It's a turnkey service. Nice. So I know you have a crew and that's mm-hmm. one of the things that's always difficult in the trades. How have you been able to maintain quality and have good people on your team? 
I was I was doing an interview just the other day, two days ago, and they said, what is the work thing you hate the most about your business? And I said, employees, that makes it hard. I don't I don't hate them, but that's what makes the job hard. And every time I say that, if I'm speaking and I say it, people always go, amen, that is the problem for every business is dealing with employees. And for, and for painting, I think it's even harder because it's not hard to start a painting business. You don't need a ton of money. And as soon as people learn what you're doing, they figure out your process and your system, then they, they quit and become the competition. So that's been a, a, a it, it's always just a, something you're always going to have to deal with. I had a great crew uh, between four of us. We had over a hundred years combined experience, but my two main guys just quit me about four years ago. Thank God they waited till the end of the year. They know I needed them and I had all winter, but it's been a struggle ever since then. It's hard to find good help. It's, then with the COVID that made it even worse. And um, what I was paying $12 an hour for, someone to just mask and cover, not even paint, is now $20 an hour, and it's still hard to get help. So that's the hardest part. I try to train them. We talk every morning. And the hardest part, I I think, is not teaching them our system, because it really isn't all that complicated, is getting them to uh, the customer engagement. The, the talk to the, you know, the help the customers feel like you you know what you're doing. Don't just clam up. So that's what I put work with them the most. You know, I tell them just be their friend, be a regular guy, tell them what's on your mind. If they ask you a question, just answer it and things like that. So the employees, that is the hardest part of my business. And I, I have one guy who, who stayed with me, bless his heart. He's been doing it like for 35 years and him and I were, we're getting too old to do this. So that's why we don't get bigger. We just take nicer, easier jobs because it, it is getting harder, but I still love what I do. But the employees are probably the hardest part of the business. If you got family and friends that you can trust and do a great job, my advice to you, treat them like gold because it's hard to get good people. And that's true. Mm-hmm. And it has become harder than ever. And sure has. we'll see how that, uh, how that changes in the future. But right now, You've got to uh, to deal with that option, and and I think that's a a complaint or a hassle that every employer has to deal with is yeah. getting the right people and oh keeping them happy and keeping them uh, on staff. One yeah. of the things you also talk about is that niching down has really helped you to be more profitable. Can you share a little bit about that? I love that part too, because honestly, the first thing I'll say about it is, you know, the expression that your niche will make you rich. I don't know. I wouldn't say it's made me rich, but I'll tell you what, the more I niche down, the more I've, I, I fine tune who I'll work for and what type of house I'll do, the more people want me. It's crazy. When they find out uh, I'm booked, I'm already 30 houses booked ahead, 40 houses last year, we were 45 houses booked ahead. I, I tell them, I'm sorry, but because of our the demand, I can't even give you a bid. And um, it's gotten to the point where unless you have an aluminum sided home or a cedar sided home, you know, those old houses you see that are peeling and uh, I don't know, that are that are just labor intensive. You know, I tell them I can't do that. I'm sorry. I can't even give you a price. And they want me even more. It's crazy. Oh, so and so said you did such a nice job on their house. I said, but it, the older host homes, they don't mask and spray nice. It, you got to scrape them and prime them. They still don't come out nice. So there are certain types of homes. So I got to the point it, when I first started, I said, I'm only going to be an outside painter. And that was my first niche. I thought if I could just do that and, and run my business, and it got to where I could do that. Then I said, change it. And I said, I'm only going to be an outside painter, but I'm only going to work for, for homeowners because I realized I didn't want to work for contractors. They were, they were hard. They get a lot of bids. They t- Hire the cheapest because the cheaper they can get someone to do it for, the more they make. So I cut them out. I said, no more, only homeowners, only exterior. Then I went to only aluminum and cedar sided homes. And now I'm to the point where um, only the nicest, the the people that I enjoy, I can tell they're going to be good to work for, the ones that are referred or past customers. And because of that, I haven't advertised now since 2012. I'm going on this is my 10th year uh, without advertising and my business still grows because I keep niching down more and more and more. Um, I don't necessarily do more houses now, but I still bring in more dollars because they're higher dollar jobs and we do them faster. I grew up in one of those cedar shake houses. So I know what do. a pain they are to paint. Yep. And my it mom was... and dad's the same thing. I, Never I have fun. a lot. <laughs> yep, all I have a lot of brothers, and that's how I got into the business. But every one of us have painted that house for my mom and dad. They, they don't still; it's not still there any longer. But uh, 
um, yeah, that was, we learned the hard way. That was a tough way to make a living. And that was where I started for those early years. And, um, Oh my gosh, I just cringe when I think about it. It sends chills up my spine sometimes. And but but paying that price is what opened the door, I think, for me and, and just sticking it out for the long haul. And that's what it is. Show up, do the work, do great mm-hmm. service and and keep doing it. And eventually over time, you mm-hmm. build a reputation for yourself. Treat people well. Treat right? people well. So now you've created a course, Attracting Customers for Life. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, my my book is titled Attracting Keep Customers for Life, and that has the four abilities. And the course is people, after I got the book done, people wanted more. They were reading the book, but they still had questions. They would call, and and anybody buying the course or can talk to me, they can call me, we can email, but they wanted more help after the book. And I thought, let's take this a step further then. And I created a a a 100 page, like 105 page workbook, uh, 25 videos where I'm sitting right here where I'm at in my office, and I talk about different parts of of the book what you need to do um where you need to go I, I i don't just tell people what they need to do i give them resources where they can go um i love i created the course for who i was 20 25 years ago someone who's entrepreneur wants to grow their business or own their own business and um and not just in the service industry pretty much how to treat people if you're a salesperson It's kind of the same stuff. It's the way to treat your customers. It's those people skills or interpersonal skills again. And the course talks about that a lot, having the right mindset for business, understanding it's more of a a marathon than a sprint. But as you just said, you do it for the long haul and you will get there. I mean, things will start to change if you're struggling. But I've got a lot of great things in my course that will help you get past that things I didn't have when I started. And um, I don't know if you're going to ask me this question yet, but I'm going to pretend like you did. What is um, um, what was the one thing you do different if you were starting over? If I was 18, I was I was hard headed. Then I wouldn't ask for help. And that would have been the biggest thing if I would have just painted for a painter, maybe for a year or so first and ask for help. Their business owners who are successful are glad to help. But I was afraid to ask anybody half fear, half just being bullheaded. I thought I could figure it out on my own. And that was a big mistake I made. And another reason why I created a course that I think I just take you by the hand and show you exactly what you need to do. And that is a big part of it, asking for help. I I mm-hmm. think in the past, it was always you had to do it alone. Mm-hmm. And today, I think people realize you have to be much more collaborative. And if you get help or you get a coach or whatever it is, you're going to be able to achieve your results faster. And people mm-hmm. are willing to share you know, even if you give all your secrets away, it doesn't mean the other person's going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, you know, I read something really interesting uh, when I was researching for my book is uh, successful people will spend money to save time, but unsuccessful people spend time to save money. And I was that guy. I was unsuccessful. And uh, I learned the hard way. Now, if I see somebody has something that I need that would make my business easier or better, I, I spend the money for it rather than try to figure it out myself. But uh, that was a big lesson for me, and it cost me years looking back. It really did. Uh, and there's a book that came out last year that's very popular, Who Not How. And so, Who not how? yeah, in other words, if I have to do something, it's not how do I do this, it's who do I get to do this. I and that's that. truly how you can scale and grow in multiply your time is don't say, Hey, I got to learn how to do this. Who can I get to do this for me? And how can I create a partnership? So I'm not paying full price for these types of things. And there's a variety of ways to do that. Yeah. Back when that, um, when that whole thing was going on, my wife gave me those three little words that turned out to be three big words. Um, I, I, I said, I started looking at people who were where I wanted to be. Those were the people I targeted and I talked to. The weird thing about it was like, now you can go online. I can talk to painters on any part of the country, any part of the world. But this is, as I said, I'm old. So I, I did all this before there was an internet and every painter in my area, they, they want to keep secrets. They don't want to help you and don't want to tell you anything because you're competition here. But now with the inter- internet, it's easy to get help. That mm-hmm. it truly is. If people Mm -hmm. would like to learn more about your book, your course, where's the best place for them to find you? Um, Probably everything is right at where uh, my um, my website at terrybag.com is just my name dot com. 
And uh, if they Google or just Google my name and it'll come up, uh, hopefully the spelling or the link would be in the show notes. I the would guess. link will be in the show notes. Make it easy. Great. Yep. And the last name, it doesn't sound like it looks. It's T-E-R-R-Y. Last name is B-E-G-U-E. It doesn't sound like, look like Beg. And I think it's a French name, but that's what it is now. So terrybeg.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. I had a great time, Rocky. Thank you so much for having me on. I hope I didn't honk too much of the conversation. Not uh, at all. Yeah, I, just, I had a great time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode with Terry and Rocky. My name is Gita. I am one of the Profit First professionals on the Profit Comes First team, and I am going to give you today's action challenge. Terry and Rocky talked today about what it means to be a premium brand and how to demonstrate to clients that you're worth the money. The small details matter, and as Terry said, people skills matter more than tech skills. Personalizing your proposals or any other client interaction shows them that you're worth what you charge, even if you're more expensive than your competition, which is not always a bad thing, by the way. Today's action challenge is to think about how you can slowly align your actions with what you think your business should be. If you're a premium brand with a high price and you don't have as many clients as you'd like, maybe you can think about how to build more trust with your prospective clients so that they don't hesitate to pay you what you're worth. Maybe there's areas in your business where your processes need improvement or where it makes sense to hire someone else to do something that you're not that great at. And no matter who you are, what your business is, or what your business needs to grow, any small changes that you make will add up over time. If you want a done-for-you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. You have your own area of expertise, and maybe you want to spend more of your time doing what you love. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to five million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. Hey, it's Rocky. Don't forget to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul, where we talk about life beyond money and how to live that ultimate life and become a better leader in your company. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.